please be seated. We continue to worship this morning through the worship of giving, and uh, the deacons will now come forward to um, collect our tithes and offerings. The offering today is for local budget. Local budget means this place, this building, these lights, those sorts of things. God bless you as you give. Uh, could we ask that you kneel for prayer? <coughs> Father in heaven, we are truly grateful to be here today, to be in your presence, to have your sweet spirit here with us because you have said where two or three are gathered, you are there and we thank you for that. We also thank you for the great privilege of being able to give back to you in our small offerings, they may seem large to us, but you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You don't need them, but you ask us to give back our tithes and offerings to further the gospel as we share your good news to the entire world. I would also pray that you will be with our preacher today. Bless Parashka as she speaks to us. Touch her lips, touch our ears. May the two connect. And may we hear the message that comes from you. I pray a huge blessing on all of us here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning to all of you. You know, I think I am the most fortunate person in this church to sit at the very, in the very first straw because when you were singing, I could listen to it and I could hear the whole congregation behind me almost lifting the roof. It is an awesome experience. Thank you very much, worship team, for leading us into God's presence. Uh, you know, in the last week as I was looking at the news, I think all of us realized that Europe somehow overtaken the news topics. And you know, rather than talking about a controversial, although exciting, because prophecy is fulfilling right in front of our eyes, I'm not going to talk about Brexit. But there is something else that has happened in Europe, or is happening, that does catch my attention. More on a positive note. And it's Euro Cup 2016. Now, I can see some heads nodding. And because I come from Europe, I have to admit that even me, my husband, and my whole family's passion is soccer above all other sports. And when it comes to a big event like that, we are glued on the telly. Well, sometimes only the summary, but we love to watch it. And I was wondering as I was sitting there, now that I can actually have the time to watch the summaries, that why is it that draws thousands of people to watch a game like that? And as I was looking and focusing and watching the teams, it brought such a joy to me when I see a team playing together. You know, when they learn that they can trust each other, they know that they can actually help each other out when they are in trouble. And when they do it per perfectly and harmoniously, it brings a smile on my face. So as I was watching the Euro Cup summaries this week, it brought to mind the church. Because like it or not, we are God's team. We are playing on God's team. Now the Bible calls it different. It actually calls it the body of Christ. And it comes through in, in Corinthians chapter 12. And this is the chapter I would like us to focus on. To see that, um, that uh, what he is teaching us uh, how to live our lives and how to serve each other in this chapter. Now, children, sermon search. So watch out for the following words. Church, hand, and captain. So the three words are church, hand, and captain. If you open your Bible, or if you don't have it with you, you can read with me from the screen. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where I'm reading from verse 12. And here Paul gives the definition of a church. And this is how it goes. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we are all given the spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now I want to draw attention to how diverse group Paul is speaking to. What do we see in the scripture? We can see that their diversity comes from their race. Here he says there were Jews and non-Jews. Their diversity comes from their social economic position because it says there are free and there are slaves. Now, add on top of that the diversity of different positions, gender differences, age differences, different spiritual gifts, and all it adds up to is one ugly mess. Or at least it should, but it doesn't. Name a situation in modern life when people from all over these diverse continuums can get together in harmony and oneness. Let's be honest, just watching the news questions you, how can people live together in harmony? We hard press to see a community of oneness anywhere we turn, no matter what the diversity manuals are telling us or teaching us. 
And you know why? Because for humans to live together in harmony, they need a reason. They need a purpose, something that unites them. And if you don't give them a reason, they will naturally cluster according to their kind and their traditions. So let me ask you this. When you look at the human body, as Paul is bringing the picture before us, what does your hand and your foot have in common? What about your liver and your hand? Or your kneecap and your kidney? You know, what they have in common is you. That's the uniting factor. If you could stand every true Christ follower on this stage, and if you could unpack their lives, their cultural differences, their traditional differences, their experiences, their, uh, their joys, their sorrows, their challenges, we would be overwhelmed by the diversity. But you know, we would ask, what is it possible to unite all these people? And it is one thing, it is Jesus Christ. What links them is Christ, and what links us is nothing less and nothing more than Jesus Christ. He is our common ground. He is our tie. He is our bond. Now, I want you to look at verse 12 again. After Paul says, though all the body parts are many, they form one body, so it is with, with what? We expect him to say, so it is with the church. But no, he says, so it is with Christ. That's how closely we, the church, are linked with Christ. We are not Jesus himself, but in a sense we are his hands and his feet in this world. When he was on earth, he inhibited and worked through a human body, and in a sense, he still does exactly the same, only through millions of human bodies. We are Christ to the world. So in this local expression in our church of the body of Christ, we better get in touch with the basis of our unity, with the very fact what harmonizes us, our foundation, Jesus Christ. You know, God is just such a community of oneness. When I look at the diversity of the Trinity, it truly is amazing. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. One mind and united by a loving servanthood. That should be us. A diverse collection of of parts brought together by a powerful unifying agent. And that leads us to oneness in purpose and in service. So what can get in the way of this beautiful picture of God's plan of the church serving as one unity? Now that is Paul's very next topic. And I heard Jim Toxon call it Team Buster and it is independence. Now, independence can come in two ways. It come, can come as inferiority or as superiority, and both are deadly, and that's what Paul talks about next. So let's look at inferiority first. From verse 15, Paul says, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now that is quite a picture, isn't it? The whole body, just one big giant ear. Paul says that that is exactly 
what I am asking for you are asking for. If we allow the enemy to tell you that you are not needed. Imagine if the people who say, oh, I'm not like someone else, I'm not needed. I need to have someone else as gift to be valuable. Imagine if those people got their way. But that's what we are asking for. That's exactly what we are asking for when we are jealous of someone else's gifts or ministry. When you think you are not needed, you are asking for the body to be one big ear or one big eye. It's not only ugly, but it is dysfunctional. We look at people who are up in the front. I look at Wayne and the singers, and I wish, oh, wish I could sing like that. But then God says, no. Don't be jealous of other people's ministry. Be happy with where you are. Can you imagine the world made up of billions of leaders? Can you imagine the world made up of billions of movie stars, or six billions, or seven billions of, of presidents? And God forbid that many preachers. <laughs> imagine you take a flight, you board a flight, and when you are sitting in your seat, the captain voice comes over the radio and says, this is your captain speaking. The reason why your ticket was so cheap today, because we thought it would be good to put, up, put away with the people you never see. So we thought the navigators and the air, for, air control uh, people are not that important up in the tower. And even the maintenance people who regularly check the aircraft so it is safe, we thought we don't need them anymore. Oh yeah, and by the way, we thought it wasn't necessary to have the safety people who check for weapons at the entrance have a nice flight. <laughs> the more visible people you see are all standing on the shoulders of so many more support people who do their work, do their ministry, and that's how they support their leader. And allow the people to serve and to fulfill God's purpose for their life. Take away the support stuff, and the leader comes crashing down. The whole church comes crashing down. Because God has given us the gift so that it is perfectly, harmoniously fits together and functions. The inferiority complex I'm talking about is actually comes from false humility. I've seen it. I've done it myself so many times. I'm not needed. What good am I? Maybe so I, could be sh I should be someone else. I could do someone else's job much better. That is not humility. That is actually pride. This is feeling the entitlement. I deserve to be in a better position. I deserve that other person's position. And if I don't get it, I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to console myself by telling myself that that team is so inclusive, it doesn't need me. You know the man with the one talent in the Bible? Remember when he received his one talent, he hid it? Did he do that because he was humble? No. I think he did that because he was proud and maybe even resentful of the other servants because they got more talents. If he had just invested his gift well, if he had just looked after what he has been, what he was given. It didn't matter that it was smaller than the other ones. Then the master would have given him the same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. So when you and I fight against who we are in the body of Christ and hide in inferiority, do we see what we are fighting against? We are actually fighting against God and for his call and his purpose in our life. You know, last weekend I was up in Broome, a much warmer climate. And Saturday night we went down and closed Sabbath on the beach. It was beautiful. 
And then all the goals went up to my enjoyment and the soccer ball came out. And we started playing soccer. Three churches, Newman, Broome, and even Derby came and joined us. And I remember at one point, they said, okay, it's Perth people against Newman. And uh, they got me. They said, Piroshka, come, we need you. They must have been really desperate. But <laughs> so I went and joined the team. And by the time I got there and got my, kicked my shoes off, I saw everybody was in position. So I asked them, where do you want me to play? And they said, go in the goal, be a goalie. <laughs> so I went to the goal, and, and sure enough, I stopped two balls in a row. And I said, wow, I'm doing my best for the team. And um, a minute later, they passed the ball, and the left defender, he missed it. And, you know, I was standing in a goal, and I said, I wish I was there. I could have stopped that ball. And you know, then I started looking at the other people around the field. And if I stopped that ball, I would have passed it over there. And then we could have scored a goal. And you know what? Ten seconds later, there came the ball. And it came as slow that even my grandma could have stopped it. But no, it rolled straight into the goal. What a lesson I learned. You know, because I was so busy looking at the other person. I was so busy criticizing him and even comparing my skills to his skills. I actually, what I finished up with, I was letting my team down. And that's what happens. You change your focus of God, what, what God calls you to do. You change your focus and the whole team, the whole church suffers. So you might think that your spot in the field or your spot in ministry is not the best one. But you know, if you think and if you stick to it, then God is going to bless you and he is going to promote you. Let's go on with the chapter and let's read verses 18 and 19. But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? You know what I find so exciting about it? That who arranged the parts? It's God. God is the one who has given you a unique ministry. Whether it is teaching, whether it is cooking, whether it is singing, whether it is with audio equipment, you name it. God gave it to you. And God made sure you have the personality that best suits that ministry so that together we can serve him. We can be the light to our community, to people around us. And I find it so encouraging, so uplifting, and so honoring. God himself, he took the time to look at me personally and to look at you and to bless you with skills, talents, spiritual gifts and personality. So independence can kill a team and a community in two ways, inferiority and superiority. So let's look at the second one, verses 20 to 23. As it is, there are many parts but one body. Now the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The day you figure out that God wants to use you, the day you figure out that God has given you a special ministry could be the beginning of pride for you. You know, I heard that there is nothing that brings out the weakness in anyone than being put in a leadership position of being promoted. And it is so good. Superiority kills just as badly as inferiority. And you know, Jesus was fighting it all through his time here on earth. He's, he was trying to teach his disciples, you are all equal. But even towards the end of his ministry, what were they fighting about? Who is going to be greater in the kingdom? Time after time, he brings this lesson to them. And it comes to the Lord's Supper that evening. And they're all sitting 
in that room after talking about who is going to be greater and then nobody wants to get up to wash someone else's foot because that was a servant's role. And then Jesus gets up once again and teaches them a lesson. And he says, don't you understand what I have done to you? And he teaches them a lesson. You are all equal in my sight. Your gifts, your talents are all equal in my sight. What unites you is me. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, then all these will pull together and will create a perfect harmony. So independence can kill a team. But let's talk about now community payoffs because that's what uh, Paul is getting into. The paths that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the paths that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable paths need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given great and honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. So what are the community payoffs? One is mutual care. Again, there is no better illustration than God's in God's design than the human body. The unpresentable parts of the human body are on the inside. They are delicate. They are very, very delicate. Exposed to the outside, how long would your stomach your liver or your kidney would exist for, not long. But God made sure that all these indispensable parts are protected by your ribs, by your muscles, and your skin. So in turn, the heart, the lungs, and the stomach feed and nurture the ribs and the skin. And this mutual care works itself out in the body of Christ in more than one level. Those with upfront gifts rely on the people who work behind the scenes. A worship coordinator, audiovisual people, the people who change the lights so that we can see, the people who pay the bills so that we can, have, we can have electricity and see the PowerPoint. All these are working together so that someone can carry out the ministry. And I'd be remiss if I didn't do that right now. Because my work, there are lots of fruits, but they are all the result of a lot of people working behind the scene. A husband, my children, an elder, a worship coordinator, a small group leader or a welcome coordinator. They are all behind what I do and what we do in the upfront work. So mutual care pays itself out, plays itself out mostly in love. This goes far beyond merely working together to truly caring for each other. You know, I like how it says you have to have concern for one another. Vince Lombardi was asked what it takes to have a winning team, and this is what he said. There are a lot of coaches with good soccer clubs who know the fundamentals, have plenty of discipline, but still don't win the game. Then you come to the third ingredient. If you are going to play together as a team, you've got to care for one another. You've got to love each other. You have to protect each other. You have to feel in for each other and correct each other's mistakes. I have to do my job well in order that he can do his. The difference is caring for one another. It's not just working together, but having the heart. I care about you, and I care about you more than I care about myself. In a healthy church, it's more than just working together. It's working together in love. 
You know, in verse 27, the phrase says, each one of you. And in the New Living Translation, it brings out, each one of you is a separate and necessary part. It is crucial. You are not here by accident. You are meant to be here. Your gifts are not an accident. They are meant to be. Each one of you puts the emphasis on the individual's uniqueness. Notice that this whole chapter we just read, it's actually putting in front of our, our eyes or redefining our needs versus our wants. What we want versus what we need. We may want to have someone else's gifts, like Paul said. We may want to live our Christian life in independency. We may want that special position. We may want that special relationship. But those are wants, not needs. And Paul says your real needs are, and he lines it out, that I need care. We all need care. We all need identity. We all need security. And we all need responsibility in order to grow and gel as one unit, as one team. Tell me something. What are those needs going to be met? Where and when? I believe that these needs are going to be met when we each, each one of us understand that it's not about our needs first, but it is about the other person's needs first. The human body does not exist to feel the needs of my hand, but my hand exists to feel the need of my body and return its needs are met. The body of Christ does not exist to meet your needs. You exist to carry out the work of the body, but in doing so, your needs are met. The following is a part of an interview of a coach of a successful team. He said, when a football player goes into a game, he can play to a variety of audiences. He may play for the crowd in the stands, for example, working hard for their cheers and avoiding their boos. Or he might be he might be playing for a special person in the stands, a girlfriend maybe. A player may allow the other team to de dictate his play. In other words, if the man across the line isn't very good, then he doesn't play well either. If the opponent cheats and plays dirty, so does he. Some football players allow their teammates to determine the quality of their play. Some focus on the game officials, the referees, and of course, some play merely for themselves. They work hard to be the stars. But my, many audiences vie for the attention of the players. My men know, however, that there is only one person watching the game that matters, only one person whom they have to please, me. Regardless of the cheers or boos, the strength of the opposition, the fairness of the officials, or the play of their teammates, I am the only audience that counts. When everyone knows that and plays that way, they pull together, do their best, give it their all, and win. You know what? We are talking about a soccer team. Let's talk about the church. In the church, we can do church. We can serve. We can do our ministry to please different audiences. We can do that to please our relatives. We can do that for fame. We can do that for so many other reasons, but God says there is only one audience that is important and counts, and that's me. God is our leader. God is our coach. God is the head of the body. And he is the one you are accountable to. And one day, when this whole game is over, we have to stand one-on-one -on -one facing him and give an account. Give an account of what we did with our talent. But to do that, we have to surrender. 
We have to surrender our ambitions. We have to surrender our past experiences, our plans. We have to put it all down in God's hand and say, God, here I am today. Use me. Use me so that I find my place in the body. Find my ministry. And please help me to put other people's needs before mine. If you do that, if you play for our God, if we focus on him and him only, we'll pull together and his blessings will overflow us. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you heard the words of this song that we just sang and it is our heartfelt play, prayer this afternoon. Lord, we surrender all to you. We want to thank you for our church here in North Perth want to thank you for all your blessings and especially that each one of us is a part of this church. Lord, please guide us, show us our place in the body, help us to focus on our ministry and help us to uplift you in our community. You promised it and you will do it through us and we thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.